It's time for another edition of Saturday with Seniors, brought to you by Eisenhower's Tioga County Harley-Davidson, south of Mansfield. And if you need a place to store your bike this winter, somewhere it'll be safe, somewhere you don't have to worry about the cat climbing all around it or it getting scratched like your garage, you can store it for free at Eisenhower's Tioga County Harley-Davidson as long as you have at least $899 or more on parts and labor done to that bike over the wintertime. So think about it. Maybe you need some new tires. Maybe you want some more chrome, some more horsepower, some whatever. You can get free storage by meeting those requirements. See their Facebook page or give them a call for all the details on that. And thank you for sponsoring Saturday with Seniors. Eisenhower's Tau County, Harley-Davidson. Today, we have Bruce Dart joining us here. And today, we have part two of Bruce Dart. Bruce Dart, longtime resident of Mansfield. You may know some of his photography work. A veteran, too. We'll have plenty to talk about on Saturday with Seniors. So when you go to the museum, uh, History Museum in Mansfield, there's the old photos of the students each year from the yearbooks and everything. Are you the person behind the camera on many of those photos? Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of them, yes. <laughs> and it was interesting because we were there one time with my brother and my mom and dad, and mom got looking at the pictures, and here's dad and me and Steve, Larry, Sue, all that, and it was all listed by Dart. And my mom says, well, I'm not here. <laughs> and my brother Larry turned to her and said, Mom, you weren't a Dart then. <laughs> her name was Booth then. <laughs> you look over here. <laughs> and they found her over there. And she was over there. <laughs> wow. Your military background. Let's. We were kind of bouncing all around here, but uh, tell me about what inspired you to go into the military and a little bit about you, that. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in those days, it wasn't so much a choice. You had to sign up for selective service system, and the decision was pretty well made for me. I took a light workload for credits because I was working in the A&P store to pay for everything. And so uh, during the summers, I had to make up credits in order to have enough credits mm -hmm. to graduate. So my former teacher, Dr. Steve Bensetti, came along and says, well, why don't you come with us to Europe? <laughs> it's an art tour. And at that time, it was a little over $1,000, which in 1968 was still a very big chunk of money. Yeah. In fact, there's a cute story about that because I was working, running the checkout during a lunchtime, and Steve Bensetic came through the line, and I had the check that I had to give him for the trip in my pocket at the time. Why? I had just gotten it, and I needed to see him and get it to him. And here he comes through my checkout line and I handed him this check for a thousand dollars and he's look at here everybody he just gave me a check for a thousand dollars he made a big deal of it but uh, yeah the 32 day tour trip it was two days of travel and 30 days in Europe and we hit five countries uh, all that for a thousand dollars yeah yeah Spain France Italy and what was then Yugoslavia and Greece it was amazing we had cathedrals we saw in 23 cities and they were all fantastic but after a while it's like, oh, no, not another one. <laughs> but they were all ornate. They were all beautiful. And they all had so much history. And it was wonderful to be able to see all that. So how long were you in the military? I was in four years and one month. Our oldest daughter was due to be born five days before I got out of the Navy. And I said, uh, uh, that's not going to work real well. If things go wrong, I need to stay around a little while longer. So I extended another month. But I spent a year and a half aboard a destroyer out on the west coast USS Osborne we went to a lot of places I never would have seen not all of them were on my top list but so it was like a cruise ship you got to yeah it wasn't, like a cruise <laughs> it wasn't a carnival ship. cruise line <laughs> no. we stopped in Pearl Harbor on the way over but it's 1700 miles from Los Angeles to Honolulu and you're doing that at 27 knots and the view never changes of the Pacific Ocean <laughs> it took us 11 days or 17 days or something like that to make to that far and yeah. that doesn't even halfway across so you know we stopped in some other places like Midway Island and then ended up in Japan we were in uh, Yokohama Bay and Yakushka with a view of Mount Fuji in the background and then we ended up in some other Japanese places we actually got to go to the uh, World War II Museum in Nagasaki we spent 30 days in, in Da Nang Harbor in Vietnam putting out gunfire support we went to the Philippines for Thanksgiving we went to Hong Kong for Christmas. We went to Taipei for New Year's. And then we went to Bangkok, Thailand. And then we went back another 30-day tour up in Tonkin Gulf following an aircraft carrier. 
because aircraft carriers take 20 miles to turn around. They're big. and uh, That's a big turning radius. Yeah, it's a big turning radius. So if somebody misses the tail hook and a pilot goes in to drink, they got to have destroyers following along behind that can zip over and pick them up. We never had to do that, fortunately, because those guys are really cocky, but there's a reason. They're really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was an interesting scenario where we had a cute story. The military is constantly a state of preparedness. They were all running drills all the time. <laughs> And we'd hear the bosun whistle, and he'd say, this is a drill, this is a drill, general quarters, all hands man to your battle stations. Well, guys were goofing off. They would stop in the mess decks and pick up a... The ship's only 390 feet long and 50 feet wide. You can get anywhere in a real short amount of time. <laughs> but they were taking 20 minutes to get where they were supposed to be. And we were up by the DMZ where we might have been more susceptible to some return fire than anywhere we were. And all of a sudden, one day, there was no, this is a drill. Well, it was just general quarters, man your battle stations. And we thought, oh boy, we're in for it now. Mm -hmm. Everybody was where they were supposed to be in under two minutes. And the CO comes on the PA system laughing. He says, I guess you guys can do it if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> you never know how fast you can run till a bear chases you, as you I say. You got it. <laughs> well, there's an interesting story in the Tioga County history. I don't know if you've ever looked at Andrew Sherwood was interviewing his grandfather, Justice Burr Clark, and he apologized for the personal narrative. He said, one, because I had access to it, and two, because it's indicative of all the things that the settlers of those days did. And so he said that he had set a trap in the woods for a bear and he caught a bear and he said I thought I would have some fun with a bear before I shot it well all of a sudden the chain came loose from the trap and the bear starts chasing him through the woods and he's running along and he dropped his rifle and tripped and just about the same time that the chain caught on a branch and stopped the bear and he says he went back and got his gun and shot the bear because I had all the fun with him I wanted <laughs> but that was indicative of what the kinds of things that those settlers did in those days and it's the same kind of scenario, you know, where you just do those things and people do it and don't think anything of it. Yeah, the world uh, keeps on changing uh, as we as we move along in time and I'm sure, when, well, when you were a kid the people that you talked to who were your grandparents there probably told you about a whole different way of life than you had. Uh, yes. Well, on the farm, the snow drifted crazily up on the tops of the hills and my grandparents got snowed in for a month at a time because they didn't have snow plows. There were no snow blowers at the time. They didn't have plows big enough to plow them out because it would, snow would drift three feet or more in the road overnight. It would have mm -hmm. snow in the field and, uh, or, and yeah. it would drift, Just... drift into the road. So they got snowed in a month or so at a time. And so they had to have all those food stores. They canned everything. Their garden was like five acres. Grandpa plowed it and dragged it and then planted it with a tractor. <laughs> and they had everything imaginable. Pretty self-sufficient, the farmers back then. And during World War II, the stories they told, they were self-sufficient. They only bought two things when they went to the store. One was flour, one was sugar. Everything else they made themselves on the farm. They had cows and chickens and pigs and sheep, and they butchered all their own animals, and they had everything that they needed. They were self-sufficient. And they canned acres of stuff from the garden, and they had their store right in the cupboards. <laughs> a true victory garden during World War II. Is it, the <laughs> it was, about five acres. <laughs> so how did they get milk to the market then if they were stuck in for months? They have a sleigh that they used to pull there. That's or? exactly right. They had a bobsled and a team of horses, and they put the milk cans on the bobsled sled and met the milk truck at the top of the hill every day with the milk cans. Again, they knew no difference, so <laughs> that was how it was done. That's what you had to do. <laughs> <laughs> on the farm, if they wanted to make a phone call, you remember as a kid, you had to you had an operator yeah, then, right? It was right? a party line and an yeah. operator, yeah. So you remember whether it was like so many rings, short and long rings, that's how you knew it was a call for you or yep, that place. Yep, that's it. The, and you never knew who else was listening. <laughs> <laughs> the term I heard was rubbernecking when people are listening in on your call and yep. um, you hear the dog bark in the background like, wait, neither of us have a dog who else is <laughs> yeah well they know the neighbors and they know who had the dog yeah <laughs> Gertrude off the phone <laughs> yeah so the veterans park here in Mansfield you and your dad uh, were a part of putting that together on route six over towards sheets over there more than a part okay <laughs> dad and I co-chaired it I got involved in it as kind of a mediator <laughs> the old memorial that was down by the town library and I had found some research on this in 1944 Mansfield Borough Council 
Council authorized the construction of a veterans memorial for World War II veterans at the town library. And again, it was the kind of thing that town library was the focal point in the town at the time. So that made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And over the years, that wooden memorial deteriorated. I actually photographed it all later and, and gave a copy of it to the library. I hope they still have it. I don't know that. I never asked them. But at any rate, that deteriorated. They put another memorial in there, and it ended up being a... Uh, cinder block construction with masonry around there and a couple of plaques on them, which we still have on the current memorial. And that got to be in rather rough shape, and it wasn't really a tribute to anybody, and we said we got to do something. Well, my dad was on the library board at the time, and he and Luke Pfluger got arguing about the memorial. Luke wanted to move it to the north end of the library, which was in exactly the same amount of space. But for whatever reason, Dad wanted no part of that. He wanted it to stay where it was, and he just dug in his heels. And every time Luke brought it up, he says, well, you got to keep room for the tank we're going to bring in. <laughs> <laughs> we had no plans to bring in a tank. So Luke came to me, and he says, are you sure there's not another place? And I didn't think there was, but I thought I'd explore that just to make sure and prove him wrong. Well, we found that space that used to be borough property that now belonged to the Corps of Engineers suddenly became available. And we went to project manager at the time for the Corps of Engineers. It was a guy named Rich Keppel and told him what we wanted to do. And he says, that sounds like a great idea. So they gave us a 25-year lease, which is we got two more years on, and then it's got to be renewed. I can't believe it's been that long already. But at any rate, we raised $45,000 to build the park, and half of that that was local match and half of it were grants. And I kind of wanted it that way. I didn't want it to be all grants. I wanted it to have a local match and local ownership, local mm -hmm. interest in the park. And we built it not only as a memorial, but as a community park. And so we included benches and picnic tables and everything at the park, all those benches, even no matter where they are in the park, all the picnic tables, they all face the memorial. And every one of the chairs, the benches that are there in the park. We planted a tree behind it so that eventually, uh, some of them are starting, but eventually yeah. they'll provide some shade if somebody wants to sit on one of those benches and contemplate their career in the military or whatever, or somebody they lost. So it's been a quite a trip. There's been some recent uh, work done on the park, too. Were you you're still involved with that? Not involved. I'm, I'm in the middle over my head, <laughs> as usual. There was a water problem down at the park, and there wasn't adequate drainage on there. It was a fill area from the Corps of Engineers after the flood. So eventually there was enough water that the gazebo we had there shifted, and one of the uprights and one of the rafters also broke, and then the next thing we knew, the whole thing came to tumbling down. So we had to replace that. And that has been a more recent project. And then along comes COVID. And then along comes some mm -hmm. of the wettest summers and falls that we've ever had. And you can't get in the park because it's yeah. so doggone wet. If you put a piece of equipment on there, you'd bury it. It'd be there forever. It'd be part one of the part monuments. Of the park, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been a, a big problem. And so it's taken much longer. And uh, I've rather frustratedly lamented to some people that Dad and I built the whole park down there with less hassle than what we've gone through. <laughs> through to do some little things, you know, because it's just a different world when the materials aren't available and the weather doesn't cooperate. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's been... The stars don't align for you on that They one. didn't. Yeah. When we built the park, we had all the ceremonies there, period. The VFW did Memorial Day, but we did 9-11 uh, and Veterans Day. And uh, I can talk for another half hour on that too. But anyway, the VFW took over Memorial Day and that was great. But uh, we dedicated that park 11 days after 9-11. We had already scheduled our dedication ceremony. Then 9-11 happened. So we're very much tied to 9-11 and Patriot Day. And there's another interesting story there. I had to handle the dedication ceremony. Our speaker was Mark Hamilton. We had a podium that had a shelf on it, and I copied the dedication ceremony out of the American Legion manual. I had no clue how to dedicate anything, <laughs> and I had it all typed up. It 
it was in a manila folder. It was right probably about at Mark Hamilton's knees as he was speaking. And a gust of wind came up and started blowing those papers all over the park. And one of our guys fortunately tracked them all down and brought them all back to me. I'd have been dead in the water. I had no <laughs> idea yeah. how, to, how to do that. I wouldn't have known what I was going to do. And uh, for the next 20 years I've been down there, if I had anything to say, it was printed out and it was duct taped to the top of the podium. <laughs> it wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> Live and learn. <laughs> and most recently, the weather's been such, it's been so wet that we've had several ceremonies in the fire hall. And thankfully, we have that community resource. But, you know, we built the park to have all that stuff there. And it's really frustrating to me not to be able to have all that stuff there. But it works much better than having people standing on wet, soggy ground or anything similar. Veterans have had to put up with stuff like that. And, and yeah, we've done worse. But to expect people to stand there and, and at a for listen to a ceremony, it's just, nah, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> I can understand that. Hopefully our weather goes back to normal at some point. But uh, uh, We hope so. I believe we could go, flood of 72 obviously was a wet year, too, and uh, with the hurricane coming through. Do you remember Mansfield and the flood of 72 going into town? And I've seen the, the book, a flood of 72 book. There's some really devastating well, pictures. I've, I've seen the pictures, too, and the water came up to my parents' front porch, but it didn't come in the house. I was in Connecticut at the Naval Submarine Base at okay. the Okay, so you were, in, I was you were doing here. your own thing with water. <laughs> it was not here. No, I had chore duty, thankfully. <laughs> so uh, we'd put out the base newspaper, and we had a uh, five-minute Navy news program of one of the local radio stations. That one, because of the proximity to the submarine base and the fact that General Dynamics Electric Boat Division built most of the Navy subs just down the road in Groton, it was WSUB radio. <laughs> <laughs> and your church, Bruce, it's got a lot of history, and you love history, and I love people who love history. Yeah, Tell me about what, what church are we talking about? It's the First Baptist Church of Mansfield. It's the big brick church up here on the corner off Main Street. It was established officially in 1840. In 1840, there were a group of eight people that petitioned the East Sullivan Baptist Church to be uh, released from that church to found the church. And think about that. It's East Sullivan Baptist Church was eight miles out of Mansfield. That's there, a half there a were, day by horse. There, at least, <laughs> a horse and carriage. And the roads weren't good. They must have been just paths at the time in 1840. And then in 1843, they were officially recognized by the Tioga Baptist Association. Most of the Sherwoods were involved in the formation of the church. Daniel L. Sherwood, the son of Deacon Daniel, his father, was also listed as one of the prime movers on founding Mansfield Normal School. He was active in state politics as well. He was, I don't know what, forget the title, he was Speaker of the Senate, which is now a position held by the Lieutenant Governor. There wasn't a position of the Lieutenant Governor at that time. He could have been Governor, but he finally got out of politics. Politics. And then he moved to Northumberland and got back in politics. I don't know what the deal was on that. I never did find the rest of that story. But at any rate, the church itself, the building that's there, was built and dedicated in 1889. And uh, years ago, I gave some money to have the church history written. I got some money from my dad when his stepfather passed away. And Grandpa George always loved history. And he was secretary of the Mansfield Fair Association. So anyway, I, I gave some money to the church to have the history written. And well, eventually it came down to the fact that I realized that if anybody was going to write the history, it was going to have to be me. <laughs> and I did. And I found a wealth of information in the archives of the church. And I kept getting it out. And from March until the church anniversary in June of the, the 150th year, I got stuff out. And I didn't want to take one of a kind images and just tack them up on the bulletin board there. So I made copies of them and mounted them on Matt board and then posted those on the bulletin board. I changed the bulletin board every week from the middle of March to the 20th of June. And we had enough at that time to get display boards and have a big display of all the stuff that's going on. And we still put a lot of those photographs of all the pastors that we had. There's quite a display of the pastors in the church itself. It got to be really interesting history and uh, what happened with all of that over the years. And we've put together a booklet and it was great. And we had two ladies that were up the street that were descendants of one of our founders and one of the first early trustees of the church. But they were involved in a Presbyterian church, Esther Gerald and her sister Barbara. And 
Esther sit kind of half up. And when we had events, we invited them because Thomas Gerald was the one we're talking about. And they would come and help celebrate with us. But Esther said, well, we're Presbyterians because mom married a Presbyterian minister. (laughs) (laughs) There's some reason that they switch teams. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, you just find all that stuff when you start digging into history. It's just just fascinating when that happens. So you went through these archives. I I love looking at old stuff like that. There were these papers that I hadn't been looked at. In, in years and years and years. Years and years and years. And there's a story that was told early on called Harvesting the Wheat. Now, in the 1840s, there's no corner store to go buy your groceries. Everybody grew their own. And it was a particularly wet year, and the potato crop already failed, and the wheat was dangerously close. And this one day, the sun came out, and the wheat was in the sheaf, and the pastor's brother was out harvesting the wheat while his Reverend Abijah was preaching and the church building was a, a just a like in fact it, they was moved up on Sullivan Street and became an apartment house they had just plain windows and there were no stained glass windows at the time so the congregation could sit there and watch the pastor's brother harvesting the wheat up in the neighborhood of Decker Street or wherever and the pastor the whole time was preaching on keeping the Sabbath and the people were going back and forth between the <laughs> brother and the pastor <laughs> seeing how this is going going to turn out and they still debated on which one was right whether they should have kept the sabbath or not but they, they would have starved if they didn't have take care of some of that stuff yeah so i, I think the exemption would have been there in yeah. that case <laughs> should have been yeah <laughs> but abijah wasn't about to exempt his brother Ex- yeah <laughs> <laughs> it made an interesting story that we found in the archives so the whole story was written in there yeah wow i love that type of history stuff that's great yeah it was great but at any rate between that and the anniversary of the legion and I had some conversations with Joyce Tice at the History Center who supplied a lot of information and I tried to give her back stuff that she was missing. So it was great to promote that for the area. Yeah. Well, you and, and Joyce and, and several others have done so much work to preserve our history and heritage in this area. And those that have never been to the History Museum in Mansfield, uh, I, I really encourage you to go. There's so many pieces of memorabilia in there. It's not a huge museum, but it's huge in amount of stuff that you can see. Well, you get involved in it and it's kind of like the old Buck Owens song, you get the tiger by the tail and you can't let go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Bruce, I appreciate your time. Bruce Starr joining us here on uh, Saturday with Seniors. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and everything. Thank you, Kevin. It's been a good ride. You've been listening to Saturday with Seniors, brought to you by Eisenhower's, Tioga County, Harley-Davidson, South Mansfield on Old Route 15. Don't forget Eisenhower's for your winter storage and ask about their free winter storage option when you spend $899 or more on service, parts, and labor. Uh, also, keep them in mind for your holiday shopping at Eisenhower's Tower County, Harley Davidson. And if you're looking to sell your motorcycle, they buy used motorcycles there as well. And if you missed any of today's episode, go to uh, our YouTube channel or just search Saturday with Seniors on YouTube and you will find uh, that we have close to 80 programs on our YouTube channel to watch or listen to uh, that include residents. Uh,